Welcome, Director. Ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Brian, for uh, asking me to come along tonight. Um, I'm actually quite looking forward to sharing a few of the things that I've discovered, because although Brian's already let you know that I do write the odd letter or two, um, I hadn't really done very much about looking into the past, and I've found it really quite entertaining. The second thing is that uh, I certainly, I'm going to offer a disclaimer, I hope that I'm not going to upset anybody, um, and if I do, I apologise in advance. I'm, I can't believe I will, but you never know, particularly uh, writing letters and some of the people you upset there. So it certainly isn't anything that I say or any examples that I use are not uh, meant to be in any way political at all. So having got that out of the road, um, I hope you understand that. I thought some of you, I guess I'd better tell you something about me first, I suppose. Brian, I wasn't going to, but I guess I am now. Um, I was born in Parkside in Adelaide or South Australia, uh, and uh, I was actually born in that beautiful old building or home that's part of Walford Girls Grammar School on Unley Road, which was in fact a hospital, so I believe in those days, although I can't recall it. But anyway, that's where I was born. <coughs> um, my brother and myself um, were educated at Scotch. Um, I might say that we didn't come from a wealthy family. I've got a feeling, and which is sad that I don't quite know, but I've got a feeling that uh, my grandparents paid for us because I'm quite sure that my father couldn't have afforded to have sent us there. But anyway, um, after we left school, um, I went on to Adelaide University and did a, a qualification in PE and then at Flinders University in education. And uh, my brother actually left school at the very same time, although he was a year behind me, because he'd been uh, awarded a, um, a cadetship at the Advertiser. So it was probably a little strange that two brothers a year apart left at the same time, but that's uh, what we did. Um, so there in itself is probably the first risky thing uh, that talking about your own education and I apologise if that's offended anyone because I've certainly offended some people in the newspaper uh, accidentally um, when um, I mentioned in a letter, uh, in fact I've got it here, when I was at the University of Adelaide I was fortunate enough to have a lecturer who gave us all the very good piece of advice. He told us that there's nothing wrong with making mistakes, it's only idiots who make the same mistake twice. Now a dear <coughs> friend, perhaps adversary of mine who writes letters, and there is a bit of fun in receiving replies, <laughs> some good, some bad, but uh, this gentleman, who lives not far away, not in Gawler, but he lives not far away, Mr Drewer also states very naively that he went to university. He perhaps forgot the fact that just because someone goes to uni doesn't mean they have any brains. <laughs> Any pillock can get a tertiary education, which is clearly seen by the brainless twits running this country. <laughs> and so, if Mr Drewer so immodestly states his educational level, doesn't that show a lack of proper thinking straight away? Anyway, I got a smile out of it. And he's quite a prolific letter writer. Some of you might even guess who it might be. <laughs> um, it only goes to prove you can't please all the people all the time, and it would be, as Brian said, it would be pretty ordinary if every letter that was written did please all the people all the time. Um, so after I finished at uni, I spent 36 years teaching in various um, places in the independent, the Catholic, and the state government department of education. Most of my time was spent at Westminster School in Marion, in Adelaide, um, and uh, it was very enjoyable. My education degree, I majored in Australian politics and, believe it or not, Chinese, modern Chinese history and politics. Um, and I certainly, <laughs> I certainly didn't do it because I'm some left-wing communist. Um, I actually was very stubborn and decided I wanted to do politics and 
the only the only unit I could fit in at Adelaide Uni was Chinese politics, and I was struggling to spell the word China, let alone anything else. But I thought, no, I can do it for one year, and um, then I can swap over to something that I really wanted to do. <coughs> but in fact, it was just the most enjoyable study that I've ever ever done. And of course, it all depends on the presenters and the lecturers and the tutors. Uh, and we had some marvellous ones. And um, so I just kept going. Um, and I could spend half the rest of the night telling you that after I'd finished, I, of course, now you just go down to the local travel office and book a trip to China. But in the mid 70s, it didn't happen like that. Um, and uh, I wrote to the Chinese embassy and said, you know, basically, how lucky are you? Uh, I want to go to China, and they wrote back saying, well, you've got to get a, join a group. And I wrote back to them and said, no emails and stuff in those days. I don't have a group to join. So, in fact, that in itself was interesting because we got to Hong Kong and then had to find the communist Chinese office and get visas and all that. But it was, it was fantastic. It really was. So, you might think that my interest in letter writing and public affairs history grew out of that study. Well, in fact, it really was the other way around, that I already had that sort of interest already. And again, this is probably slightly dangerous ground, but as you can probably guess from my bald head, um, I'm of the what I'd call the lotto, the lotto generation that is, conscription, and my brother and I, of course, were up for grabs, and um, in actual fact, I didn't get called up, but my brother did. And my mother, <coughs> who was an absolutely inspirational person, um, was, and thought that her two sons couldn't do anything wrong, um, and she got very, very... Uh, I guess cross in a way, not about, and again I'm not going into the area, about the fact of how conscription took place and the, and the pot luck of it. And anyway, she finished up, and I think this is the thing that inspired me most of all, and I've got copies of them at home, but she finished up having the most amazing live on-air conversations with Bob Francis. Uh, and they were, ter well, they were just terrific radio, and uh, they were challenging each other day after day. So probably that's where I really got my inspiration to get interested in making comments and so forth. So that's the way, that's the way that all happened. Um, You could choose lots of ways to sort of voice your opinion, but I chose letters to the editor as a sort of vehicle for expressing my views and making comments on others. Um, but I think before we get to that, in my research, and some of you may know that I've got a passing interest in cricket, uh, and I think perhaps one of the funniest letters to the editor, to break up the seriousness of the occasion, um, one of the funniest letters I have ever read is the following, and I apologise to anyone who doesn't like cricket. It was published in August of 1981, and it goes like this. England have managed to retain the ashes. I seek the courtesy of your columns to inform those very many Australian friends who now owe me a bottle of something, that if they wish I shall be happy to roll over each and every bet as double or quits on England still retaining the ashes at the conclusion of the next series between them to be played in Australia. I suggest this in part to avoid a possible dislocation of Australian liquor supplies were all my creditors to meet their obligations simultaneously, and in part because of a shortage of storage space at my home, space which will I will ensure is more than doubled for when it will be needed in 1982-83. <laughs> John Mason, British High Commissioner. <laughs> uh, just, I just thought that is really quite, quite good. Okay, so we'll have a quick look at a bit of the history. Uh, obviously, letters to the editor 
are contained mainly in newspapers. And I'm sure most of you know, if not everyone knows, um, the earliest newspapers date back in, to the 17th century in Europe and um, basically were printed periodicals that began to replace handwritten news sheets. Um, it wouldn't take a rocket scientist to work out that the spread of new paper, that newspapers was connected very much with the spread of the printing press as well. In actual fact, the first newspaper <coughs> was in 1605 in Strasbourg in Germany. Um, the first English newspaper was in 1620, and in fact, the Barrow's Journal is the world's oldest newspaper, which is still running. In 1702, the Daily Coursant in London was the world's first daily newspaper. Its last issue was in 1735, when it merged with the Daily Gazetta. First US newspaper, newspaper was in 1704, the Boston Newsletter, Boston, Massachusetts. Australia's earliest newspaper was the Sydney Gazette and New South Wales Advertiser and was first published in 1803. The Sydney Gazette and the New South Wales Advertiser was described as, love this, moral to the point of priggishness, patriotic to the point of civility. <laughs> it was the only publication in the colony at the time uh, and was strongly censored by the government until William Wentworth launched the Australian in 1824. Amazingly, only ten years on, there were seven newspapers in New South Wales and five weeklies in South Australia. Victoria's first newspaper was the Melbourne Advertiser in 1838, and by the mid-50s there were 11 newspapers in Tasmania. <clears throat> you wouldn't have thought they had a population for 11 newspapers, but there you go. Um, the, Australia's longest running newspaper is the Sydney Morning Herald, and that was first published as the Sydney Herald in 1831. Sorry about the history bit, but it's reasonably important. Um, the Sydney Herald was first published as a weekly. It became a daily newspaper on the 1st of October 1840. By 1842, it had changed its name to the Sydney Morning Herald. The Herald's rival, the Daily Telegraph, was first published in July of 1879. Now we can talk about Gawler. In relation to Gawler, the first country town in South Australia, as we know, founded in 1836 and named after the second governor of the colony of South Australia, George Gawler. Um, Gawler was established, of course, through a special survey, and as Brian has stolen my thunder, the Bunyip subtitled the Gawler Humbug Society's Chronicle and makes some amazingly interesting reading. Uh, when it was first published on the 5th of September in 1863, it consisted of eight pages and was cost you sixpence to buy. And the South Australian Register, um, quoting, observed that it, quote, full of racy articles and local hits, a very humorous article on the Gawler Agricultural Society, uh, the, the Gawler Agricultural Society's last dinner, which was not only very amusing but strictly correct and should undoubtedly prove a great success. In the very first edition is the very first letter to the editor. And not only is it beautiful, but <laughs> the way it's written, which is a bit different to the way we write things today. Um, it's on page two, and I'm going to read a little bit of it. I won't read the whole thing. It breaks so many rules in relation to today because it's far too long for it to be published today, but it's, it's, it's worth a bit of. It's prefaced by saying the editor of the Bunyip does not hold himself responsible for opinions advanced by his correspondence in this part of the paper. Here is the letter with a preface to the editor of the Bunyip. Dear Sir, as it is likely that your paper will reach all whom the following epistle will concern, 
I beg to forward it to you and request your earliest insertion of the same. I remain in the bonds of the society. Yours, Hezekiah Jones. Gentlemen, having made a handsome fortune through my prudence and unlimited foresight besides my very business tactics and my having sat in the public gallery of the Legislative House of Assembly consecutively for months together, watching the proceedings right and wrong in that noble Senate, learning and discerning the outs and ins of parliamentary etiquette, looking up Samuel Johnson's dictionary for the vo vocables that I did not learn at school when I was a boy, besides trying to put my house in order, as well as my brain canister. I have conceived an idea, or rather, I feel an inward call to become um, sorry, it's that side, isn't it? To become a legislator, and therefore I feel I must shortly come before the public to seek their sufferances for I believe a vacancy must shortly occur amongst the precious white locks of John Anderson, John, John Anderson, uh, my John description of members. Anyway, it goes on and on. Uh, and uh, so from the very start, it has a letter from issue one. Um, the Bunyip was originally published as a monthly um, but it soon became a bi-monthly, uh, being published on the first and third Saturdays of each month. It changed its name from the Bunyip or the Gawla Chronicle and Northern Advertiser. In 1866 it became a weekly. By this time the paper's original offbeat starts had quite vanished and it had become a regular newspaper. In February 1885, the Bunyip building was destroyed by fire. William Barnett, the proprietor, immediately arranged for the printing duties to be done by the opposition competitor of seven years, the Gawler Standard, but even smarter, he arranged with the proprietor Richards for an immediate merger. Um, interesting also from the Bunyip, its first issue elicited a libel case, so it didn't take long for somebody to get into trouble, and it was a libel case against William Barnett by a Dr. Home Popham, who had set up a hospital in the town and who had advertised boastfully in the Northern Star. The court proceedings were a merry affair. I'm not sure of that word, merry. The court proceedings were a merry affair with Mr Stowe appearing for the defence and the jury found for the plaintiff awarding damages of one shilling. <laughs> While we're talking about <laughs> libel and things like that, I haven't ever been sent a reply from an editor like this, but I really thought this was quite funny. This has got nothing to do with the uh, Bunyip, it's got everything to do with the South Australian advertiser though. On July the 12th, 1858, published a Joseph Blenkinslop. Your letter has been received and disposed of according to its merits. <laughs> <laughs> Obvious, I would wonder what the topic was. Ah, <laughs> uh, dear. Okay, so what is a letter to the editor? By definition, a letter to the editor is a letter that's sent to a publication uh, about an issue of concern uh, from its readers. It basically can be on any topic. Um, it's probably obvious that most letters to the editor are sent with the intention that they'd like them to be published. But they can also be sent to not only newspapers but magazines. Um, periodicals and I guess if you stretch the imagination a bit now we've, we've moved even further from that I, I would sort of tend to argue that a letter to the editor or the purpose of it could 
almost move into the concept of talkback radio. Uh, it could move into different forms of social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc. <coughs> now, some people might agree with that, some won't. I think in the end we won't probably see, which I think is very sad, we we'll probably won't see hard copies of new newspapers. It mightn't happen until we're all dead, but uh, already I've got a lot of people who read lots of their newspapers online, and I think that's probably what's going to happen. Um, many of us probably despair at the sort of thought of the use or lack of use of the English language in today's world, but a man that I find very fascinating, and I'm sure some of you listen to him as well, um, Professor Rowley Sussex, who used to appear with Carol Whitelock and now uh, with Peter Gers, um, is an interesting person because he has no problem with accepting texting and twittering and whatevering um, because he basically believes that uh, it constitutes the written language and that any form of writing is better than no form of writing. And I guess we could debate that for a long time. Personally, I think he's right um, that in the good old days we used to talk to each other. Now these kids spend their life texting each other um, and have created many different ways of spelling words, but they understand them all. I think if you... And I travel on the train to Adelaide quite often, uh, and it's just mind-blowing to sit there and look at everyone texting. I don't know what they're texting about. And I can't believe that they've got anything valuable to say, but I figure that, I figure that by the time you got to Adelaide, there would be a pretty sizable book of words that had been written. Um, I guess you could debate about the quality of the standard of the words that have been written, but nevertheless, Riley Sussex would argue that at least they've been writing something. Um, and the other thing that I find interesting with him is that he doesn't seem to be very concerned about the significance of spelling either that he, he, you know, which is so foreign to me and the way I was brought up, but uh, his argument is something's better than nothing, I guess. Anyway, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that, as we've just proved with the Gawler Bunyip, letters to the editor have been a significant part of newspapers basically since day one. Um, it's not as though they're, they're sort of an appendage. They've always been significant. And we'll get to the possible reasons for that a little <coughs> bit later. Um, the great advantage of letters to the editor is that whether it's you, me, or anyone else has got the opportunity, assuming they get published that is, um, to be able to offer political or social commentary. And when you think about it, there's not many other forums where you can get that sort of exposure. You know, you can talk to your friends about it, but that's a very limited audience. And if you do get published, it is quite amazing. I don't want to talk about my letters, but what I was, until I started writing them, what I had no idea of what Brian said tonight was so correct. I'm absolutely staggered by the number of people who make comment, good or bad, about reading my letters. Some of you may know that I do a little bit of part-time work at the Tanunda Pines Golf Club, and if I haven't had a letter, uh, you know, I get up there and they start questioning me as to why there isn't one. <laughs> uh, which is really quite amazing. But then if you do publish them, half of them criticise what you've written anyway, so you're never going to win, but that's life. Um, As I said, it allows people to make commentary on all sorts of things. But it is also interesting to look at the, the sort of unwritten and written rules about them. Um, for instance, most of them are sort of called opinions, and that's a significant factor. It's not necessary. You'd like to think that it's all based on fact, but it is an opinion of a person 
and some people are going to agree with it and some aren't. But it does allow you the freedom of expressing yourself, which I think is pretty important. And that's been true since the earliest times. Um, during the middle of the 19th century, the move, there's an interesting sort of sp spatial importance about where letters to the editor are placed. And there was a, a move towards the centre of the paper or the publication, and there was another interesting move that they got closer and closer to the editorial columns as well. And without going through it, I'm sure that you read them, that's where they are now. Mm. So it's, it's one of the rare things that for a long period of time, the style of publication, sure, the language has changed, but the style and where they are has remained pretty common from a long time in the past. What they attempt to do, I believe, is, and the advertiser does this amazingly, and partly, I'll get confused by running two things together, depending on the size of the publication depends upon the number of letters they receive. It wouldn't take much imagination to realise that the New York Times probably gets thousands of letters a week if not hundreds and hundreds per day. And so the chance of getting a letter published is not all that great. Whereas, with all due respect to the Bunyip, the Leader, the Herald, there would be nowhere near that many letters. And so the chance of getting published in a smaller publication is far greater. But what they do, no matter whether it's big, small or indifferent, is they attempt to balance it out. So whatever the topic is that you may have chosen, they will run your story and hopefully somebody else's that has a different view. And that's, that basically is the way all letters to the editor are chosen, with some exceptions. Um, of course, letters stating the very obviously are just going to be re rejected instantly if there's profanity in them, if they think they're libelous, if they think it's a personal attack. Um, and uh, interestingly, if they're written anonymously. Now, there's an interesting trend in that because in the very early days, they were published without names. And then there became a very strong movement um, to reject any letter that didn't contain the person's name and address. In America in particular, you know, as only the Americans can do, um, they had a strong argument for um, freedom of speech, etc, etc. And they did, for quite some period of time, publish considerable numbers of letters, letters without uh, addresses and names. But, um, by the late 1900s, just about all newspapers rejected any letters that didn't have a name and address. Having said that, and I've got a really good example, I reckon, of which was published on August 21st, 2014, that if they think, if the editors think that it's interesting enough, or perhaps questionable enough, but worth publishing, if you've supplied your name and address, you can request that they don't publish it, and they will actually just publish it as name and address supplied. Anyway, so in general these days, they won't publish. However, there is a new tendency in the double pages that we're getting not just letters, or well, they're printed, but you're getting SMSs, you're getting telephone, you're getting a whole range of ways in which you can send your message to the paper. But the fascinating thing, which I really haven't understood as yet, 
is that, and it's happening in the, in the Bunyip and the two other local papers as well, but they only publish a first name and they don't publish a suburb. So they've almost gone back to the anonymous thing. Now why, why they allow that? Now sure, they're going to have your telephone number, but it's, it's not out there for publication. It's just an interesting move, I think. Um, yeah, so, you know, the, the whole range is there. You can go from email to phone to social media, Facebook, Twitter to send them in. Dare I say, the Australia Post. <laughs> want to be one that wasn't too current. <laughs> if you want to get it published, I would think. Or SMS. Okay, so let's have a little bit of a summarising. Why do we write letters to the editor? Or why does anyone write letters? Because basically you feel strongly about some sort of issue. Um, and for reasons for most writers that they want people to know what you are thinking about. Sometimes you think you can even influence people to take some action. Um, you know, in a way, as I've mentioned already, writing a letter to the editor is, is, is like talking to a newspaper or a magazine. And you can take a position and you can inform people about what you might be trying to get over. The advantage of the d today's sorts of rules about letters to the editor are that they can be emotional, based simply on emotion, or they can be based on emotion and facts as well. The other thing is that I guess it comes with practice, but they've got to be short. It's interesting, every whether it's the country papers, the city papers, they all say at the top, keep them to less than 300 words. Well, my dear friend who wrote about my educational bragging, he writes letters of amazing length, and um, I'm not quite sure he get, how he gets them published, but he does. I might say that they are published in the country papers rather than the city papers, which possibly might indicate that um, there's obviously less letters being sent in to country papers. But however, in, in reality, the most successful letters are those that are really short, tight, to the point, so that people want to read them. The other thing that a letter to the editor can do, because newspapers, television, news, tend to get hold of a topic, give it a run, and then drop it. Whereas if you're concerned about a topic and want to keep it going, then the method to do that is by writing letters to the paper and hopefully getting people to react to them. And it is quite, basically what I'm saying is you keep, you're attempting to keep that topic that you've chosen in the public eye. And quite often it's reasonably successful. I said, and I'm not going to go through many of my letters, but some of you probably realise that I, probably the South Australian Cricket Association isn't my favourite organisation. And um, they have a fantastic habit of, of letting everything drop um, rather than face the reality of some things that they're into. And they, for those of you, I apologise, I've got no interest again in cricket, but a few years ago, because they were performing so badly, they decided that they were going to have a complete review of the whole place. And they got in oh, three or four very big name people. And I would think paid them a great deal of money. And the report has never been seen. And so every few months I just write, you know, the report must be due for publication shortly. <laughs> and, and I think the advertiser... I think the advertisement particularly thinks we're playing good games because they keep publishing that blit. You know, in fact, sometimes now they'll, I'll write a letter and I haven't even included it and they'll tack it in on the end of the last paragraph. <laughs> so I think they're waiting for the report as well. But it's quite interesting. 
I promise I won't talk about cricket once again other than just to say this. Um, and the person concerned, who I'm not going to tell you who it is, doesn't live that far away. He's in the Barossa Valley. Um, <coughs> I was at the golf club one morning and this certain person who is on the board of SACA, without me even mentioning it, said, oh, well, of course, Lehman isn't the sort of role model we want at the SACA. Lehman is coach of the Australian cricket team. And yet they have this setup, of course, where uh, the David Hookses, the Lehmans, the Ian Chapels, all were people who weren't yes-men. And so they don't entertain anyone who isn't a yes-man. And, of course, Lehman isn't a yes-man. Not good enough to coach a Saka, but good enough to coach Australia. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, I don't think. <laughs> However, right, I promise that's the end of cricket. Um, so, the other thing, and I'm, I'm going to look at the way particularly letters reflect on a community like Gawler a little bit later on. But the other thing is that if you want to praise somebody or some organisation, letters to the editor are a very, very good way of doing it. Very few papers are going to write a story on how well Vinnie's looked after us last week. But it is amazing in the time that I've been writing letters that you, you could almost say once or twice a month there will be a thank you letter, whether it's to a charity organisation whether it's to the Gawler Health Centre, whether it's to whatever, there are, so, you know, and also, dare I say, and we're probably all of that age, the number of people who write in and thank somebody for picking up their wallet and handing it back into Woolworths or Coles. And you probably don't think about it at the time, but I guess because of what I've been doing in relation to tonight, it is very common that those thank you letters appear which is a really lovely community spirit thing, I reckon. Um, so, there we go. So there are good newsletters as well. So not everything... I have been accused of being very negative in mainly over my criticism of SACA, but I'd like to think that it really is constructive. But there are lots of good newsletters, and I've actually written some too. Um, <laughs> not that many. <laughs> needs friends. <laughs> um, as I said, the reason is that you are after expressing your opinion to other people and you're searching for a, lar a larger audience. When should you write a letter to the editor? Well, you obviously write a letter to the editor when you feel like it, when there's a topic that's upset you or there's you wish to express yourself to uh, a wider audience about something, a program, the people, inform people of what's going on. To get a letter published, it needs to stand out. So as I said earlier, you've got to be concise and almost hit the reader in the face to draw attention to it, else they'd stop reading it. So you can't really ramble on for the first couple of sentences. You've got to hit it and lend them the know. You've got to grab their attention. That's really what I guess I'm trying to say. So that very first opening sentence is really important. <laughs> I still love that about poor Joseph, please and stop. Your letter has been received and disposed of according to its merits. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he ever wrote another one. <laughs> uh, quick, concise is the way it's got to be. The other secret is you've got to use plain language. You can't afford to be blindly scientific because the vast majority of the people, whether it's whatever topic, aren't you know, technically on board with that. So it's got to be in layman's language, but being capable of getting your point across so that most people can understand what you're trying to say. It's always good if you can give evidence as to why you're saying it, 
you can get away with not, but you've got to be a little bit clever in the way you do that. But you're far more likely to either not only get it published, but for readers to read it and formulate their own opinion about what you've written if you've got some basis under which you've written it. Um, it's very true to say that just about every publication will simply stay away from rants and raving. They just won't entertain it for the risk of upsetting people. Uh, but they quite often, if you camouflage your rant mm. in more gentle phraseology, you can get the same point across with a degree of subtlety which then allows you, uh, well, gives you the chance of something getting published. The biggest exception to that in almost outright criticism and complaint is that they very rarely reject criticism of politicians and public figures. <laughs> it is quite staggering that if, you know, if I was to write an absolute rave criticism of one of you, the chance of it being published is zilch. But if I write it about Tony Piccolo, I, I'm given within reason of what you're trying to say, they, they run with it. And I think that's, again, an editor's choice um, and privilege of choosing what he thinks is controversial and therefore likely to generate commentary and interest. But politicians, generally speaking, are pretty fair game. I mean, with one exception, of course, is if something is libel. Um, and although I thought, well, I guess I do know what libel means, but I, I did look up the definition of it, and it really is quite interesting, particularly when it comes to publication. Libel is the publication of a false statement about someone that damages that person's reputation. Thus, to falsely accuse someone of a crime would be libel. To inaccurately print that someone had won an award for citizenship would not be. So although you've, it's been published and it's an incorrect fact, uh, it's, it would not be libelous which is an interesting concept, I guess. Um, I guess what I've been trying to say is that Letters to the Editor is a really powerful tool if it's used correctly. I've already mentioned also that the editorial sections of the newspapers are amazingly widely read. Not just the letters, but the editorials. And if you look at, and I'm not sure... If you, but there is also a move for huge opinion columns. There, there are one or two opinion columns in just about every daily newspaper, country or city. You know, it, when, and we're not just talking about a sports writing column, we're talking about, you know, the political ones, a whole heap of them dare I even say Peter Gers on Sundays. Um, but they are, they are growing. The, the number are growing. And there's another in interesting trend, I think, in that, um, and we're getting there in the end, to the, the historical factor, but one of the incredible boom areas of publication, and there are letters to the editor within it, is Boomer in the advertiser. It's getting bigger and bigger, the history section of it and the photographs, etc., are just awesome. Most of you don't know me from a bar of soap, but amongst other things, I'm pretty heavily interested in rock and roll. And um, when they ran the, uh, the stuff on, on um, my Ponga pop festival the other week or so, it was just fantastic. I actually spent three days there, so there you go. I saw Black Sabbath and Billy Thorpe and all those boys. They were the days. <laughs> and I don't write music like that anymore. Sorry, some of you wouldn't call it music, I guess, but there you go. Um, 
Okay. Now the next interesting thing is that the the world of organize, uh, of of groups and business pay, believe it or not, huge attention to letters to the editor. I discovered through my own writing experiences and certain organi business organisations that they pay companies, and I guess I'm not very gee whiz with all this electronic stuff, but there are companies that are set up that can find and collect for any given company anything that's printed to do with them. Uh, I said I'd never, but you know, if, if I mentioned the word SACA, everything that s mentions the word SACA, whether it's my letter or everyone else's, or even the columns or the sporting journals, it's all sent to the SACA. Every word of it. And it doesn't matter which publication it's in. And that applies to basically anyone who has got the money who wants to do it. So obviously all the politicians do it. You know, anyone who is have vested interest in their own imagery and what the public opinion is of them. Good, bad or indifferent. So, so they obviously put a great deal of weight on the, the, the expressions that are printed in the media Public opinion, that's what I just said. It's incredibly, there's a, a very good definition of public opinion which was written in 1961 by an American VO Keys who said, opinions held by private persons which governments, read organisations, find it prudent to heed. And if you think about it, that's pretty spot on. That there are, there are people who have a vested interest in knowing, reading and understanding what the public, the general public opinion is. I guess that's what they form about an election time, eh? It's probably also true to say that, that the media uh, and the influence of commentary has spread with urbanisation. That, you know, in a little country town of 20, Everyone knows everybody and everyone probably knows the opinions that everyone holds of everything. Whereas as soon as you begin to urbanise things, that contact, that immediate contact is lost, considerably so. And so the way that we do it, in a sense, is through letters to the editor and public opinion pieces and so forth. So you really can say that it's a really dynamic thing. It's alive and that's well... Um, the other thing that I believe is so significant, and particularly in a place like this, is that letters to the editor in particular are an amazingly valuable property to historians and researchers, academics and local and family histories because of one thing in particular. When they're written, they're not necessarily designed to be pieces of history. They're designed to be a picture of, or a, a flash of what's going on at that time. And so, all of those letters are, in the build-up, influence and can tell you about what was contemporary at that time. And I think that's, this, I'm not knocking the documented history of, of written, recorded history, but this is almost accidental history, which is written with heart and feeling and at the time that whatever the topic is, is happening. It's not a, a reflection going back to something. I mean, obviously there's lots and lots and lots of history. You have no choice but to do that. But the way we can look at letters to the editor in the time that they've been around gives you a, well I'd call it a sort of snapshot, I don't like the phrase, but of what 
was contemporary at that very moment. And the good thing is that it doesn't it doesn't have any boundaries. It might be about politics. It might be about social events. It might be about the Gawler show. It might be about thanking the Gawler hospital. It might be about sporting. It might be about music, dance, Australia Day. And it's of the time, which I think is a wonderful way of documenting things. Um, it's probably the most, strangely enough, if, you, if the publications have been good in balancing out the viewpoints of whatever the topic is, it's probably as, as accurate as anything's likely to be in terms of looking at that point in time. Um, I guess the reality is that it's because letters to the editor and newspapers are actually compiled by people who have no deliberate concept about trying to write history. As I said, it's almost like a bird's eye view or a snapshot of what's going on at that time. As I said also, you do run the risk when you go public of either being agreed with or anti. And I do love this. This was written only March 21st, 2016. Not by me. The sad part about getting a letter published is the occasional abusive phone call you receive, usually from someone lacking the wit to understand the letter, <laughs> the literacy to to write their own or the courage to leave their name. For the, benefit, for the benefit of the last cretin, I did not say that I supported Donald Trump. In fact, I find all the candidates repellent. Nor did I say that he should be free from criticism, but much of the criticism he has been getting is personal, hysterical and vitriolic. He might as well be Tony Abbott. This is unfair and probably counterproductive. Because I feel that free speech should not be confined to the socialist left, I shall continue to write an occasional letter. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> That's very good, I reckon. I was speaking to a lovely friend of mine at the golf club about the concept of letters reflecting a point in time. And this was written on Saturday, sorry, it was published on Saturday the 9th of February 1867. And I find it quite amazing in not only the sadness of the occasion, but the way in which it's been written. Sir, as a proof of the great difficulty of obtaining employment in this district, allow me to mention that during the last week, I have walked more than 200 miles in search of work without success though ready and willing to take any sort of job I could get. And from all I can see or hear, I may walk 400 more with the like result. In fact, sir, there is no work s stirring in the district, and unless something is done to get work going, there seems no better prospect for the working man than starvation. The fencing in of runs, runs has thrown a great number of shepherds and hut keepers out of work, which, of course, adds to the pressure on the labour market at a time, too, when the recent failure in town and port have had a very bad effect in stopping work here. From this it will be seen that it is of no use anyone coming here from Adelaide on speculation, as the old and well-known hands cannot get anything to do. I am, sir, etc. William Othams at Streaky Bay on the 24th of January 1867. Now that is just a, um, you know, it, it, it moves me, that letter. And, you know, you could not, that is history. That is genuine history. And you can't write it better than that. And it's coming from a man at the time. Okay, just before I finish, because I've rattled on too long, I'm not sure, I hope there's not too many of you who are associated uh, with some of these topics. But 
I did a quick survey of, of letters or topics of letters, particularly in the Bunyip in recent times. And it probably comes as no surprise that, you know, like favourite, 10 to 1 odd, you know, black caviar stuff, the council gets more commentary than anything else by the length of the straight. And dare I say it, most of it's critical <laughs> rather than praiseworthy. There are some, but it is amazing the dominance of, of council matters. Now, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because we're all affected by councils. It's local history. They don't like it, or they do like it, or they've done the wrong thing. So without that, with that that's an amazing topic. Now, I will admit, <clears throat> another it's sort of associated with a council topic, but it, was, it became quite an issue and I was one who contributed, I will confess. But the green bin issue was huge. And for those of you who don't realise that there, there was a period of time when we put out green bins, and then I guess it was the council, Brian will know, in their wisdom or part of, decided that you couldn't have a green bin unless you paid for it. And there was an uproar. And there was a huge campaign Suffice it to say that, in the end, I guess we won. Because I mean, the smart thing would have been that you said it's for free, but add fifty dollars to your council rates, and no one would have known. But they did not like thinking that they had to put that you could only put a green bin out. And the campaign in letters to the editor was amazing, uh, and it went on and on and on for a long, long period of time. And. Um, I mean, again, without picking, you know, politically, I'm not, I'm not... But, you know, it was something that in the end that Piccolo even picked up and ran stories in his Enlightenment or whatever it's called uh, because smart politicians see that there's an interest from the people who vote and you've got to either get on side or do something about it. So, there we go. Council gets lots and lots of mentions. The Green Bean got lots of mentions. You get lots of... As I said, thank yous from, from to the hospitals, to the, the charity organisations. Uh, at the time of the year, the Gawla show normally gets lots of praise. Um, where else are we here? Um, great deal of commentary on roads, roundabouts, <laughs> speeding, all those sorts of things. They're, they're very common letters to the editor in the Bunyip. Um, what else have we got? At the, at the time, again, when po politics is around, there's commentary on federal elections and so forth in the local papers as well. There's been quite a deal of commentary in recent times over Gawler East development, in fact, any development around, and people will express opinions about that, which is fair enough, because that's, again, what we're on about. Um, and one of my other favourite topics, which I will admit that I have actually contributed to as well, bicycle lanes. I have the privilege or, I'm not sure whether you call it a privilege, of driving to the Tanunda Pines Golf Club a few times a week. And I know that we've really, and this is a personal opinion, right, but I know that we've all got the right to be on the road. If they had no choice, that's fine, but they do have a choice. And I don't know whether it's the lycra clad that stops the brain thinking, but do you really want to gamble with a car that's legally allowed to drive at 90 k's an hour? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And yet, my dear friends, I have had some complaint from a certain cycle organisation within this lovely town about my lack of understanding of their rights. Um, and that's all I say to them. Well, you know, I think the best was about a month ago. This is true as I'm standing here right now. I'm heading towards Tanunda. There's a bloke about that far inside the white line. He's not riding. He's straddling his bike, standing still. He's this far inside the road. He's talking on his mobile phone. 
And just outside that door is the cycle track. So that gets a huge number of comments. Not just from me, but from everybody else as well. And it is, I, I personally think, again it's personal, you know, if I get, if there's, a, if there's a bike lane in Adelaide and I'm driving in it, I get fined. So why shouldn't bikes riding on the road when there's a bike lane get fined for being on the road? Maybe I'm just not thinking right there. Um, I mention this one because it's very topical. Vaccination. And that gets a run in country newspapers, in city newspapers, because, again, it's a community issue. And whether you're for or against vaccination, whatever view, it affects the community as such. And so it's not surprising really when you think about most of these sorts of topics that they come up. Uh, more political are things like, and, and the Gawler Council uh, was involved in this topic not that long ago, of rainbow flags and, and gay marriage and all that. And, and th there are a lot of people expressed. The Bunya ran a story on two guys living together which caused quite a reaction, not so much, I think, because they were living together, but because they wanted to use the word marriage, which a lot of people wrote about and say, call it what you like. You know, there's two heterosexual people living together that aren't married, you call it the facto, there's a name for it. So if there's two same-sex people living together, we should give, give, let them live together, let them do what they want to do, but give them a name other than the word that we understand about what marriage is. And so it's those sorts of issues of the day that led us to the editor really give people the opportunity to express their opinions. Organ donation, wills, all that sort of stuff. Oh, another one. Dead man's pass. Dog walking. Leashes or no leashes. <laughs> it, you know, you could almost bet it comes up as often as the sun does. And as soon as, of course, as soon as somebody gets bitten or gets hit by a bike, it all just erupts again. I have the wonderful experience every Sunday of walking down to the uh, Gawler Railway Station markets, and last Sunday with my little dog, who's a little ripper, and um, one of the pet, uh, the stall owners that I know very well came up and said, "Just make sure that you've got Gypsy all." well and truly under control, because even the week before there'd been a dog fight. And, you know, it was a pretty bad one. I, it's the first time I've ever heard of it, because most people only take their dogs down there if they know they're going to be able to socialise with the others. Anyway, so all of a sudden we've got council inspectors at the market now to make sure your dog's under control and with a leash, you know. Still, they're, they're, the, they're the day's issues, aren't they? All right. If I could go on and on. I've rambled on a bit too long already. Licensing laws, particularly when there were the sad events surrounding some of our hotels here. Big commentary in the papers of what should happen and what shouldn't. I hope I haven't rambled too much. Thank you very much. <laughs> there must be questions. There must be. Oh, gee. Wanted to make comments all the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, now I can okay, answer. Okay, raise, raise number one. There is, there is, uh, I, I only I'll, have the I'll questions keep, if I can answer them. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll keep the video on. All right. Uh, you better not oh. this one. Oh. Uh, just, uh, you're going through the figures and naming people that are getting mentions and that, and I noticed Brian's name's not mentioned at all. I still, I made clear that I edited those out. <laughs> Has there, is there and has there ever been, in theory or otherwise, a survey to, de to, to determine whether a letter, a, a, a decent, maybe political or otherwise letter, how much of the population does that one letter represent? I'm sure there have been. I don't. I can't produce the figures for you, but I do know, in general terms, that that 
and it's going way back to when I was studying, which was, you know, when we wrote with stone. Um, but, you know, they worked out that um, a phone call was the equivalent of so many letters and etc. etc. Now, those figures, but evidently letters, whether they're just directed to an organisation or through newspapers, are looked upon by the people concerned about them as being the strongest indicator of people's feelings. That, but I think the argument's used, if you spend the time to sit down and write a letter, then you're pretty fair dinkum about what your opinion is. Mm. But I couldn't tell you offhand what they are. Right, Dennis. Speak up, Mike. Sir. Okay. Okay. When you write your letter based on your opinion, how do you handle somebody's reverse opinion to you do you immediately try and defend it, or do you just let it go and let them have their own say? If you um, just repeat the question. Oh, um, when I write a letter, how do I handle when somebody has a go at me? Do I immediately jump onto the computer to, to have a go at him or what? The answer is most of the time, this sounds shocking, most of the time I haven't, I haven't received too much criticism. I certainly have received criticism. But my dear friend up the road, we have a bit of fun. I mean, he wrote a, a probably almost a scathing letter about that I knew absolutely nothing. And I actually I took it as, as f funny and I thought, no, I'm because this guy writes voluminous stuff and I don't. I normally write. And I thought, no, I'm going to write one just as long as his. <laughs> and so, yeah, I don't take it. I mean, I, I think if I'm... If I, if I've written something, whether it's you or anyone else, they've got the right to disagree with me. And, and the, only, the only thing was that after I wrote this letter in reply to this bloke's letter, he wrote back and he took it really quite seriously. So I wrote another one with the proviso that I, I said at the end of that one, I think it's time that we agreed to disagree. And I think the editor of the... The, the local papers were probably quite pleased that, well, I'd come to that term of... Yeah. So, yeah, you just got... I mean, there's a guy who doesn't, you know, he uses the SMS thing from Cuddler. And uh, the only thing I don't like is when people personally... I don't mind them criticising me, but at least they should have the courage to write their name. And, and you know, Tom from Cuddler is a pretty... Like, it isn't Tom from Cuddler, it's someone from Cuddler, I've got no idea what his name is. But I think that's um, Coward's way of... If he, if he wants to have a go at me, let's have a full dink and go. What's your um, sort of hit, hit rate on... Like, on letters that I send in? Yeah, the lunch you send in, is it, I mean, I imagine it's different for the local papers than it is for the advertiser. And has it change over the years or does it remain stable? Right. To be honest, it, oh sorry, am I yeah. wandering too far? Um, to be honest, it's, it's quite high. Um, now, and it's higher for the Bunyip, the Herald and the Leader than it is for the Advertiser. Um, but what I've done over the years is work out how they choose letters. And for instance, sports letters, more often than not, they want to do it as a block. You know, like at, at the time when the submarine issue was on, the whole of the left-hand side of the advertiser was submarine letters. Whereas Saturday's letters on the right-hand side are just about all sports letters. So they wait to get a topic or topics. So getting back to you, my, my strike rate around here is pretty high. I'd say 85, 90%. Advertiser would be 60%. The Australian, far less. But then again, it's what I was talking about earlier. The number of people who are sending letters to the Australian, which are coming from everywhere over Australia. But the Australian's actually quite good. At, they like, they like um, very brief, particularly... Uh, the column, there's, there's two sets of letters in the Australian, uh, very smart, witted comments, you know, like one-liners or something. 
and not sorry for giving you an example of mine, but I, it's the only one I can think of off the top of my head. I wrote, I'm sure I'm not going to get this exactly right, but you'll remember when Peter Garrett <laughs> couldn't work out whether he'd received an envelope full of money or a cheque, and I just wrote, a man, uh, Peter Garrett, a man with a law degree, surely you'd think could tell the difference between an envelope full of money and a cheque. Now that got published because, you know, smart or add the other word after it. <laughs> Tony. Most letters to the, to the editor seem to have a mini headline. Yes. Do you get your choice to no, choose them? No. Them? I, I actually sometimes, they are running the show, but I, I send in, I mean I, I can only speak for myself, and there's a lovely dear friend of mine, a lot, lot older than I am, who's a retired doctor, who, who get, has quite a number of letters written, and he's got a beautiful mind, incredible. he gets lots of letters, little smart ones like in the Australian. But we, we both send in headers that we think the letter should go under, but they very rarely use our suggestion. So the subbies must do that, the sub-editors. Right. Would you keep copies of what you write in yes. case you get a challenging letter and you need to I've word got, for word it? I've got, I've got 13 books of it. <laughs> How big? Oh, there'd be... I, see, I've been writing them since... It's not as though it's... I mean, I forgot... I've been in Gawler since 1999. I forgot. I should have just mentioned it. Uh, but I was writing letters way, way, way before then. And I just keep them all. There are people who've said I should publish them, but unless you buy them, I'm, you know... <laughs> Would you keep these, like the law, I think the law says seven years for things to happen, or not happen. Would you keep these for seven years and then discard them? I'll, I'll, I'll keep them forever. My poor children can work out what they're going to do with them. <laughs> um, but what is interesting, and I know this sounds, but, and that's why I sort of could do that bit of research about topics in Gawler. Mm. I don't cut my letters out, I keep the whole page, which is really quite good because you've got all the other topics of that. that and that saves the day. Yes, it does. <laughs> so, in summary, what's some of the things you think you've helped shape Gawler? Because that's what the right. whole thing well, is about. The, 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 biggest thing, I've got three minutes. the biggest thing I helped shape Gawler, and I'm actually proud of it, is the green bin issue. I led the way with that. <laughs> Sorry for those. Brian was on council at that stage. But I really led the way. And I did a huge amount of spade work. I know this sounds a little bit strange, you know, and you think, well, this guy really is a nutter. He's got, obviously, not too many spare things to do in his spare time. I did surveys. I walked around Gawler East and I counted the lack of green bins out there. And I produced them. I wrote to the council. I said... No, and you, you're walking past red bins full of green stuff. It was, with all due respect to the members of the council, it was the silliest thing I've ever done. There we are trying to recycle everything, and they're discouraging people from doing it. And I'm really proud of that. Um, and, but I will admit that I got, there are a lot of people jumped on board to help with that, but it took a long time. I even, believe it or not, went to council meetings over the green bin issue. <coughs> I've got to do the presentation. Oh, do you? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, and in summary. And in summary, uh, I just believe, and you know, we're all different. I just believe that they are interesting and the most important thing, they are a, they are a genuine reflection of live history at the time. Uh, if you pick up this week's bunyard and look at the topics, you'll see they're things that are going on. And as I said earlier, the best thing is they're written at the time of the happening. And that's the best recorded history you can have, I reckon. Or the only other way is recording verbal interviews, which is another awesome way. We, sorry, I, when, when I was teaching at Westminster, for those of you who, Westminster was, I mean, that's a sad thing in a sense, because Westminster was simply built on the most beautiful nutrient-rich ground of all time. It was nothing but almonds and olives and grapevines. So what did they do? Bulldozed it all down, put concrete buildings up on it and ovals to call it a school, which is a beautiful school. But one of the things we did because of the rich history of Marion was in geography lessons and stuff, 
we went around to all the old local residents and got the kids to interview them and recorded it. Fantastic way of, of keeping history. Right, I've finished. Well done. <laughs>